Hello everybody, today we are going to talk about the deadliest incident in United States naval history as well as the deadliest shark attack in all of history, and that is the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. The USS Indianapolis was a Portland-class cruiser, which in layman's terms means really big ship, that played a key role in several Pacific naval battles during World War II. However, after completing a secret mission to finish the final part of the atomic bombs that would later be dropped on Japan, the Indianapolis was destroyed and the resulting chaos was, as mentioned, the deadliest event in United States naval history. Not only that, but the following days would leave the survivors treading open water while facing dehydration, sun exposure, and shark attacks. It is a very tragic story, but one that I feel deserves telling. So if that sounds interesting to you in a depressing, kind of morbid way, then stick around after the ad as we get into the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. But before I break down another fun and lighthearted story, let's talk about something else that's fun saving money. And you can start saving money with today's sponsor, the number one shopping tool in America, Honey. Honey is the free internet shopping tool that lets you save money whenever you buy something online. You can get Honey for free on your computer in two easy clicks. And from there, anytime you're at checkout at a store, Honey will search the internet for promo codes to see if it can save you money. And now, Honey even has a mobile extension, so you can get all the benefits of saving money while shopping online from the comfort of your phone. You can start saving money on things that you're already buying. For example, whenever I buy new computer or camera equipment, or even something simple like a pizza, I make sure to do it on my laptop because I have Honey installed, and every time I do, I save money for something I was already gonna get. Honey works on a lot of your favorite websites, so if you're gonna be buying stuff online, then you might as well save money while you're doing it. And you can get Honey for free by going to the link in the description at joinhoney.com forward slash Wendigoon. That's right, you can start saving money for free by getting Honey at the link in the description at joinhoney.com forward slash Wendigoon and use that link so they know I sent you. Thank you all so much for watching the ad. Thank you so much to Honey for sponsoring the video. It really does mean the most. I hope you all check them out. Link in the description and we are back to the video. We are going to go ahead and get into it, but as always... Thank you for watching. As mentioned earlier, the USS Indianapolis was a Portland-class cruiser, which was launched on November the 7th of 1931. The purpose of cruisers this size were to serve as part of fleets, either by providing artillery support to ground assaults or covering aircraft carriers as they travel through the ocean. Essentially, it's a way to put a lot of firepower onto a mobile platform. Before World War II, the ship was mostly used for diplomacy. It was involved in several training missions in South America and even transported President FDR to and from South America. The United States was attacked by Japan at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii on December the 7th of 1941. Whenever this happened, the Indianapolis was at the Johnston Atoll as part of a training exercise. And there's an entire story about immediately after Pearl Harbor, there was this huge search across the Pacific Ocean to find the carriers that could have gotten the planes that close. And if I ever decide to destroy myself and do the eight hour World War II video, I'll talk about it in further detail, but all you need to know for now is that the Indianapolis was one of the lead ships in that search for the Japanese fleet. From there, the Indianapolis played a major part in the United States Pacific Campaign, serving primary roles in the battles of the Aleutian Islands, Macon Atoll, Marshall Islands, Mariana Islands, Saipan, the Philippine Sea, Peleliu, and the second attack of Tokyo, just to name a few. And those were all times that the ship was there at the actual battle fields providing either artillery support or support for local aircraft. The Indianapolis also aided in the battles of Iwo Jima and Okinawa by going to Japanese airfields and attacking the planes as they were beginning to take off to support their men on the ground. It was during this Battle of Okinawa when the Indianapolis was almost destroyed. A Japanese bomber managed to drop a bomb on the deck of the Indianapolis to which it went through the deck 
the mess hall, the fuel tanks before going underneath the ship and then exploding. Nine people were killed in this incident, but you would think that a bomb going through the fuel tanks and then exploding would, you know, destroy the ship. But because of the bulkheads, which is essentially these compartments you can seal off in the lower layers of a ship to keep water from filling up the rest of a ship if there is a breach, they were able to contain the water to certain parts of the ship and the Indianapolis managed to drive itself all the way back to port for repairs. Shortly after receiving these repairs, it was determined that the Indianapolis would go on an at the time secret mission. In the present day, we know that this mission was to deliver uranium to Tinian Island. This uranium was the final component to develop the atomic bomb, which was then dropped on Hiroshima. None of the Indianapolis crew knew that this is what they were transporting, and as a matter of fact, the marine guards who were set to guard the box itself had no idea what was inside of it. As a matter of fact, the enriched uranium that was inside of the box they were transporting was about half the world's supply of uranium-235 at that time. On July 16th of 1945, the Trinity test was conducted, which this is the test they did to make sure that the nukes actually worked, and hours later the Indianapolis set sail from California to Hawaii. They then went from Hawaii and arrived at Tinian Island on July the 26th, meaning the entire voyage took only 10 days, and from there they then departed to Guam. There at Guam, members of the crew who were now off duty switched out with members who were coming back on duty, and the ship then set sail for Leyte. This voyage from Guam to Leyte would be the final voyage of the Indianapolis. The ship had previously received word of Japanese submarines in the area. However, the Indianapolis itself wasn't fitted for underwater sonar, so their solution to seeing if there were any submarines was to just have people post it up to see if they could see a periscope pop out of the water and that's really all they got. See, normally a ship like the Indianapolis wouldn't be traveling by itself, especially not without the capabilities of spotting submarines. However, because the Indianapolis was transporting parts of a nuke, they didn't want there to be any radio chatter or information about where the Indianapolis was going to be. As a matter of fact, the whole point of the Indianapolis traveling to Leyte was so it could reform into a naval fleet and not look suspicious, which is why it had to make the very hazardous journey through Japanese territory all by itself. It was during this voyage that Commander Hashimoto of the Japanese I-58 submarine spotted the Indianapolis. The submarine fired six missiles across a spreaded area in order to hit the Indianapolis if it was to try to take any evasive maneuvers, to which the Indianapolis was hit at 12.15 a.m. on July the 30th of 1945. Two torpedoes hit its starboard side, which is right for us normal people, and the ship immediately began to list, also known as tilt, and in just 12 minutes, the ship went from being hit to being completely underwater. To put that into perspective, the Titanic took about four hours to sink. The reason it was so catastrophic is because the torpedoes managed to hit the fuel tanks of the ship, and that exploded as well. And for research for this video, I watched a ton of interviews they did with journalists, as well as interviews they did for TV shows, so the information I'm giving is kind of just the array and conglomerate of all these different takes they had about what was happening. Given that it was midnight, a lot of the men were asleep, and they said they were all woken up by the first explosion. Some who were close to where the torpedo made impact even said that they woke up in the floor because it physically threw them off the bed. And only a few seconds later, there was a second, much larger explosion that shook everything and tilted the entire boat on its side. Several of the men on the lower floors began opening portholes so that they could climb out the side as they were unable to get up the staircase. And the explosion itself caused several to be wounded, to which the doctor and several helpers tried to drag them onto deck and begin fitting them with life jackets. Due to the fuel tanks exploding, and that being the larger second explosion, everything on the lower decks was on fire. In one account, a guy who was asleep on one of the lower floors whenever the explosions went off was running upstairs and he said the metal was so hot that he tripped at one point and his hands touched down and as soon as he stood up he had third degree burns on both of his hands. In only a few minutes the ship went from gently tilting to being completely turned over on its side with the majority of the survivors staying on the side of the ship waiting to see if it would go all the way down or just kind of set in place. 
That was until the now rolled over ship began to point up at the sky, the bow broke off and the entire thing started to go under. It was at this point that the crew who were still hanging out on the turned over ship to see if they could use it as a giant life raft now had to abandon it. It was upon hitting the water that the men realized it was not just water they were jumping into, but the ship's entire supply of fuel now spilled out into the ocean. Thankfully, it wasn't on fire that would have made the situation much worse, but as soon as the men began to jump into the water, the oil got all over them and wouldn't come off. Most survivor stories were that they jumped into the water and they would get the oil in their eyes and in their mouth and they would start crying and like rubbing their face to get it out of their eyes and they'd just start throwing up to get it out of their system. So everyone, every single survivor who was treading water was covered in tar all over their head and their face to the degree that they couldn't tell anyone apart from the other. In the following days, they all described it as something out of a dream because everyone had their eyes closed from the sun. So whenever you would look around, it would just be people covered in tar everywhere. And the only distinguishable feature was their pink mouth as they were trying to talk. As the final parts of the ship were going underwater, the pockets of air that were in the bottom of the ship began exploding outwards and it threw the men into these clusters away from the actual wreck itself. All in all, the ship went down in 12 minutes and it's believed that about 300 men died during the actual sinking itself. The total crew was 1,195 men, meaning that about 800 were now set to tread open water. And for them, the nightmare had just begun. The one bright side in this whole thing, at least when in comparison to other shipwreck disasters, is for one, all of these guys were in the Navy, so even though the Navy never taught them to swim, which is dumb, uh, most of the men at the time who decided to join the Navy had knowledge of how to swim. And two, and more importantly, this was in the Pacific Islands, which means the water was very warm. One of the biggest killers and reasons that people can't survive in water for long periods of time is hypothermia, because that causes you to lose energy and begin shutting down, and of course then you can't just tread water. So the water being like 70 degrees around the Philippines was definitely a benefit. However, as mentioned before, this is 800 guys treading open water, and no one knows they're out there, and they're all covered in oil, so it was by no means a positive experience. A few men who were on the top deck, such as Captain McVeigh, whenever the ship started to go down, had the foresight to begin throwing life rafts into the water. Ideally, everyone would have had the appropriate number of rafts blown up, and they all would have had their life vest, but as mentioned, these guys had to go from sleeping to the boat being completely underwater in 12 minutes, so only a few were actually available. There were nowhere near enough life rafts for everyone to get onto them, so the officers began to use them in order to delegate things like life jackets. See, several guys were injured during the explosion and wreck itself and were unable to tread water. So people who were unable to tread were given priority for the life jackets, and those who were able-bodied would stick their arm in the compartment behind the neck that the life vest leaves open, and they would lay the injured person up on their hip and they would lay in buddy pairs across the water. Furthermore, if anyone was really injured and it was near impossible to keep their head above water, they were given priority on the rafts themselves. Which at first sounds like a totally good thing until the sun comes up and now they're essentially cooking inside of this rubber raft, but they can't go into the water because they can't keep themselves up and you have a whole nother problem. Probably my favorite account during this entire story was that of Dr. Haynes, who was the doctor aboard the Indianapolis. He had the most detailed account and his reason that he gave for that is because he kept himself busy while everyone else kind of succumbed to the monotony of just treading water. He had a lot of the more nuanced details that I found interesting. Like for example, he says as soon as the Indianapolis went underwater and the explosion stopped, it was dead quiet. Like everyone in tandem understood the situation they were in and knew that yelling wouldn't do anything to fix it. He said it wasn't long after that quietness set in that someone said, is the doctor here? To which he responded and he spent the next several days paddling from person to person doing what he could to help. Although according to him, he said without supplies, he was more of a coroner than a doctor, really. During this time, a lot of people would become comatose and just be out of it. 
it. So they would sort of be lying there unresponsive. But if you were to do something like flick their face, they would respond, which was the only way the doctor knew they were still alive. As a matter of fact, he set his system to check if one of these floating people was alive or not, is he would open their eye and poke it. And if they didn't flinch and their pupil didn't dilate at the sun, he would assume they were dead. At first, he tried to collect dog tags from these dead, but he said it got to be so many across his entire arm that it was weighing his arm down and he had to let them go. While several were injured in the wreck itself, the majority ended up dying due to dehydration. As several who have analyzed this story have noted, the majority of the men who were now treading water were asleep, meaning even whenever the wreck happened, they hadn't taken in fluids for several hours. And now they have to constantly exert themselves for days and days on end. The biggest problem, according to Dr. Haynes, was convincing people to not drink the salt water. He said it was especially hard on the young ones. In the first day, he was able to tell people don't drink the salt water, it will make you sick, and they kind of listened, but by the end of it, he would just swim around and smack people on the back of the head whenever they tried to drink the water. Even then, he couldn't stop some who were so thirsty that they were beginning to lose their minds, and that is where the majority of these casualties came from. The other major cause of death was horrifically shark attacks. As soon as the explosion happened, and not only was there a huge noise and shockwave throughout the water, but now the water was filled with the blood and bodies of over 300 dead men, oceanic white-tipped sharks flooded the waters underneath the men. They pretty much acted like vultures underneath the water. The men talked about how if they put their head underwater and opened their eyes, they could see dozens and dozens of them circling, waiting for someone to sink beneath the waves. It's not known how many people they killed, Primarily, people just said that if someone died, they would watch a shark drag them underwater. But several of the survivors attested that they would be paddling on the water and then they would feel it bite their leg really quick, kind of checking to see if they were dead or not. And by the end of the three days, the men said it was so awful that just all the time you would feel yourself walking on the backs of sharks as they were swimming right under you. Now, there were a lot of sharks and they were eating the dead in the beginning. However, several claim that on the final days, the sharks began attacking live people and the attacks either from dragging them underwater or biting them until they bled out killed anywhere from a few dozen to 150 men. And the men, who at this point were too weak to do anything about it, pretty much had to sit there and hope that they weren't the shark's next victim. At night, there was a real risk of dozing off or floating away from the rest of the group. So at night, everyone would lock arms in order to keep people from slipping away from the group. From all the accounts I read, it seems like there were two of these massive groups, because keep in mind, each one of these groups would be like 300 people. And horrifically, at least according to one account, Paranoia had set in so much by the third night that whenever people started to doze off, they began accusing each other of trying to drown them. The way it would work on the previous nights is if everyone was locked arms, that would allow every other guy to fall asleep for a few minutes, and then they would wake up and essentially take guard as the guy next to them was able to rest for a couple minutes, and that just kept on through the night. But between the oil that was covering everyone's faces all the time, and the shark attacks that could happen at any moment, even during the night, they talked about how they could feel them rubbing against their legs. And the constant heat exhaustion, and the dehydration, and the delirium from the salt water, people started to go mad. On one of the final nights, people began to become furious at this, thinking that their friend was trying to drown them, and began to fight and trying to push each other under the water. This caused the mass of people to separate into these small clusters of people fighting each other in the middle of the ocean. And they said that after that went on for a couple hours, everyone who was of a sound mind came back together, and there was far fewer than whenever they had joined together earlier that night. It's incredibly heartbreaking that not only did the elements and nature itself take the lives of several of these men, but it seems like a few of them may have taken the lives of each other. I also want to mention on that depressing note, to make the story a little bit more lighthearted. Remember that doctor I talked about, Dr. Haynes, who was like of a sound mind because he just stayed busy the whole time? He was asked about sharks and he was like, yeah, they were everywhere underneath us. I didn't really mind them. At one point, a shark swam in front of me and I tried to grab it because I wanted to eat it. <laughs> 
Like, everyone else is losing their mind, rightfully so, and freaking out because they're being attacked by sharks. And then this doctor's like, yeah, I wanted to eat that thing. I wanted to, like, flip the food chain around on him, see how he liked it. Perhaps the most troubling detail mentioned by the doctor as well as several other survivors was the matter of deciding who was sick and who was dead. Because as mentioned earlier, the injured were given priority with the life vest. So if they died, that life vest could be used to save someone else. They spoke of how horrific this was because the process was them coming up to someone who appeared to be dead and then triple and quadruple checking to make sure before taking off their life vest and allowing them to sink underwater so that someone else could use it. The same situation was taking place in the life rafts as if someone was laying there in the scorching sun and it seems they were dead in order to keep the raft from sinking and to help someone else who's now worse off they would have to physically push them over the raft itself. Several of the accounts I watched about this were the most depressing uh, because the men would often be overcome with emotions talking about how they never forgave themselves for playing God and deciding who was and wasn't allowed to live. Even if logically we can say, well, these guys were dead anyway or they weren't going to make it, it makes sense to save as many people as you can. They didn't see it that way. This was their friends and their brothers in arms, and they were having to physically push them out of the life raft in order to pick one over the other. You may be asking yourself at this point, how does a ship like the USS Indianapolis sink and no one know about it? And the primary reason for that is the primary reason that most major shipwrecks happen, actually. Complacency about procedure. See, even though the Indianapolis was on a secret mission, so it couldn't have a fleet of ships go with it, people in high command and navigation still knew the ship was out there. So they had the entire thing based on a schedule. They had a board set up in their control room where they say, all right, the ship is on this island and then it's going to go to Guam and that's going to take three days. And then it's going to go from Guam to Leyte and that's going to take like another three days. So after three days passed with no confirmation that the ship had actually arrived in Leyte, which they were technically supposed to do, they just took it off the board and was like, all right, the ship's now in Leyte because that's where the ship's supposed to be. Lieutenant Stuart Gibson was given the task of watching over the Indianapolis itself. And the reports later say that he did have intel the ship didn't make it to Leyte, but he didn't tell anyone, I guess. So they just, I guess he figured that, oh, well, they're like a day late. I guess I just won't say anything about it. And during the naval trial that followed, the Navy said that there was no time for the Indianapolis to put out a distress call. And that's the reason that no one was able to get their SOS. However, later declassified reports said that a total of three radio operators did pick up the distress call. At one of these locations where the radio signal was picked up, the captain was drunk at the time and didn't think to reply back or record the message. At another one, the captain had mentioned that he did not want to be disturbed, so I guess no one thought to record the message that was coming in in case he wants to know about it later. And at the third one, the captain did get the message and did listen to it, however he thought it was ludicrous that the Indianapolis would be by itself in the middle of the Japanese ocean, and he thought it was a trick by the Japanese. Again, complacency about procedure. It was after treading water for three and a half days, dealing with the elements, sharks, each other, and everything else, that they were finally spotted by an American patrol plane. This plane was not equipped to land on the water or be able to take any of the men back. However, this plane, which was being piloted by Lieutenant Gwynn, flew directly at the men and got really close to the water so that they would know help is on the way. And he also dropped the personal life raft that was on the plane and meant for the pilot and co-pilot. So, you know, he wasn't able to like get them out then, but you know, adding a new life raft to the sick bay of floating dying men on the water definitely helps. And of course the plane began to radio nearby ships and planes saying that there was a crew on the ocean who need help. The first to arrive on the scene was Lieutenant Commander Marks who was flying an amphibious Catalina plane which looks like 
this. The water was very choppy at the time with 12 foot swells of water going up and down. However, Marx took a vote with his men of if they want to endanger themselves by landing the plane and they said yes. So they landed the plane and began taking people in. Also as they were landing they deployed the life vest they had as well as like this giant container of fresh water but as soon as the water hit the ocean the side of it burst open and it just poured out which is really sad. At this point, most of the men were too weak to swim, uh, with many of them saying that if they had been out there for another few hours, they probably would have died. So the crew of the Catalina began taking men and taking them on top of the wings and then tying them to the wings with parachute cord. That way, even if the plane gets tilted by the water, they won't fall off. And in total, the plane managed to hold 56 people functioning as essentially a giant life raft. Now at this point, an entire fleet of ships was coming to rescue the men, so they weren't in danger of getting stranded along with the rest of them. However, putting that many people on and doing things like tying them to the wings meant that the plane was in the water for too long and the plane was therefore unable to fly forever and is now just a giant floating very elaborate buoy that night at 4 a.m the destroyer escort the uss cecil j dowell shined its spotlight into the sky to act as a beacon for all the men on the water the men who were floating in the water began to scream and shout now renewed with energy and the doyle started pointing spotlights at them so that its lifeboats could go out grab people bring them back to the ship and keep up the process until everyone was out of the water keep in mind up until this point no one else knew that the Indianapolis was out here because remember the Indianapolis was a big deal it served a part in a lot of naval battles so as soon as these guys start coming onto the ship everyone's curious like how did you guys get out here like there's not supposed to be anyone in this part of the water however I can't 100% verify that this account is accurate or from someone that was there. However, I choose to believe it because it's funny. Supposedly, an officer got one of the guys onto the ship and he shined a flashlight in his face. Because, you know, for all they know, these are like Japanese sailors planning some super complicated trap on them or whatever. So he gets the guy, the officer gets the guy out of the water and sets him up on deck and shines a flashlight in his face. And he says, who are you? And the guy goes, I'm a sailor on the USS Indianapolis. And the officer goes, what? The Indianapolis is back in Hawaii. There's no way you're part of the Indianapolis. What really are you here for? And the guy stopped for a minute and goes, well, you see, we all decided to take a little swim out here and got lost, and we're real glad you picked us up. That was the funniest part about it, because everyone who survived talked about how annoying the officers were when they got picked up. Because you gotta realize, the ship that showed up is still doing the whole military thing, like, through and through. So they're trying to follow procedure and protocol, and all of these guys who are covered in oil and sunburns just cannot be bothered another funny account during this time was that they had like a diesel fuel mixture in order to like get the oil to come off of them um and there were these two guys who had met each other in the water like they were on the same ship before but the ship was 1200 people and they had got to know each other in the water so whenever they're now on the rescue ship and they're getting cleaned off he looks at this guy he's been talking to to three days and realizes he has blonde hair and the other guy screams he's like ah your hair it's blonde it was also during this time that the injuries of the men could fully be seen they couldn't really tell on each other again because all parts of skin were covered in oil but the guys were covered in peeling skin as well as deep scratches and burns from the shipwreck itself as well as many of them having shark bites a few of the men tragically even died after being rescued since they were so far gone from the exhaustion and dehydration that they couldn't be brought back on august 3rd of 1945 out of the 1,195 sailors of the USS Indianapolis, 316 survived. This event left 879 men dead, and the Navy needed to blame somebody. As you can tell from this story, the Indianapolis was put into a pretty tricky spot, and a lot of people wanted to blame the Navy for it. So the Navy turned the blame towards the captain, Captain McVeigh. McVeigh was court-martialed, which again to us normal people is like a trial, on two counts, 
one for failing to order an abandoned ship, and one for hazarding the ship itself. The one about failing to order the abandonment of the ship was dropped, however they stuck with the charge of hazarding the ship. Hazarding the ship essentially means you did dumb stuff that endangered the ship itself, and the Navy's argument was that he did not properly zigzag. No, I'm not kidding. Whenever you're being chased by a submarine, the evasive maneuver for these ships is to go in a zigzag pattern so that if any torpedoes are fired, they'll miss. McVeigh was ordered to zigzag at his discretion, and according to the Navy, his discretion was not good enough. Even though it was midnight and they couldn't see any submarines around them, I guess they just wanted him to zigzag the whole way to Leyte. During this trial, they brought in Commander Hashimoto, the aforementioned captain of the submarine who sunk the Indianapolis, to which Hashimoto said that even if the captain did zigzag, it wouldn't have mattered because Hashimoto fired in that six torpedo pattern I mentioned earlier, specifically to hit a ship if it tries to zigzag. However, according to reports at the time, the translator who was speaking for Hashimoto lied about what he was saying. See, Hashimoto couldn't speak English, so while he said in his own language that it wouldn't have mattered, the translator kind of blurred the lines and said, well, if he had, then maybe my barrage that I have in order to hit zigzagging ships wouldn't have worked if he zigged his zag the right way. And while he wasn't given a charge or given any real punishment, he was kind of semi-demoted and eventually retired in 1949 as a rear admiral. However, the most damaging part about the court-martialing is that the government pointed all the blame for the Indianapolis on him. From then on out, McVeigh would receive letters throughout the year telling him that he was responsible for the deaths of the people aboard the Indianapolis. Around Christmas, he would get letters saying that, I hope you have a Merry Christmas, ours would be a lot better if you hadn't killed our son. Or on random days of the year, he would get mail saying, on this day, my son would have been 32 if you hadn't have murdered him. The Navy wanted to effectively misplace blame for their own fault of leaving the Indianapolis unguarded, and they had done that as it seems. McVeigh was never able to get over the shame imposed by others, not to mention his own trauma having known the men of the ship and watching them die as well. And in 1968, McVeigh walked out onto his front lawn holding a toy sailor in one hand and his Navy issued revolver in the other before shooting himself right there. I won't spend a ton of time on this next point, but how can I not mention it? This is so wild. So it had been known by those who were familiar with the story that everyone loved McVeigh. All of the members of the Indianapolis said that he was a great captain, uh, he was loved by his family members, seemed to be a great guy. Well, the survivors group of the USS Indianapolis, who meet every year in order to have a reunion and talk about war stories, were determined to get McVeigh's record cleared. In 1996, a sixth grade student by the name of Hunter Scott began to do all of the math and get the records together to try to exonerate McVeigh. And the press began to run with this story, talking about how cool it is that a sixth grader is trying to clear the reputation of a World War II hero. And the survivors of the Indianapolis got in on this and started helping with the boys' campaign as well. They made several appeals to Congress during this time and even got Hashimoto, who, if you'll remember, is again the captain of the submarine that sunk the Indianapolis, to write letters not only saying what I mentioned earlier, that it wouldn't have mattered if he's zigzagged or not, but also saying that after meeting the crewmen of the Indianapolis, McVeigh must surely have been an honorable man. I should also mention about Hashimoto, he showed up at Pearl Harbor on the 49th anniversary of the sinking of the Indianapolis and asked the men if he could pray with them about their fallen comrades, to which they accepted him as part of the group of the survivors of the Indianapolis. It should also be noted that throughout World War II, America lost a lot of different ships in a lot of different ways, but McVeigh was the only one who was ever court-martialed over it, and I primarily feel that's because of the political reasons and also because a lot of people died. While watching the congressional hearings for it, uh, someone did make the case, kind of humorously, but a good point, that if they would have arrived to Leyte, 
and had not zigzagged, like they just took a straight line and then got there safely, would you still court martial him? Would you court martial someone for not zigging their zag enough? So finally, in July of 2001, Captain Charles McVeigh was cleared of the sinking of the Indianapolis. And then, only five years ago, on August the 19th of 2017, the wreckage of the Indianapolis was found in the North Philippine Sea, 18,000 feet underwater, over three miles down on the side of an underwater mountain. Pieces of the ship itself were found scattered in miles across the underwater chasm, but there at the bottom of the Philippine Sea, the final resting place of the Indianapolis was seen. And with that concludes the story of the largest loss of life of a single ship in US naval history. And while not as super climactic, and while definitely having stories of heroism, not having these massive swaths of turns or weirdness I normally like to cover, I was thinking about this story and I realized that there are currently only two survivors left alive today of the 316 who originally survived the wreckage. And whenever we stop talking about stories, we forget them and we forget the aspects of them. And while it is heartbreaking, you know, that eventually they're going to be gone, I think it's important to continue those stories so that they're never really gone or they're never forgotten. And this is one of those stories that I feel like deserves to be remembered and deserves to be told. So that's why I'm telling it today. And I ain't got to tell you all that because you stuck around this long. So hopefully you also think it deserves to be told in some regard. And I think that's really cool because I think so too. And I just want to say thank you for watching. Like I said, this isn't a huge over the top grand story of religion or what's another weird kooky topic I've done lately. I know there was something else I did that was in the realm. Uh, oh, or like about some disease or the trials around a disease or whatever. It's just a story from a war that I think deserves to be remembered. And I kind of want to do more of these. I have no idea what this is going to cut down to. I think it's going to be shorter than most of my videos, considering most of my videos are like an hour long. Um, I think it's going to be shorter than that. And I wouldn't mind doing a few more of these shorter like one-offs. There's another story I really want to tell about a Japanese soldier in World War II who uh, was, in the, was in the jungle of Guam for, see, I don't know the story yet, so I can't give exact facts. I think he was there for 40 years. Like he was stationed in Guam and then they're like, all right, we'll come back and get you. And he just stayed there for 40 years, like hiding out. Um, waiting for the military game again. That's a wild story. And I may tell that one um, because I, I like these little short one-off things. I'm also a big World War II nerd. So like, I, I like slightly joke at the beginning of this video that, oh, well, I'll do my eight hour World War II video, but I really want to do an eight hour World War II video. Um, I'd, that would probably kill me in the algorithm because I think I'm doing pretty good in the algorithm right now. If I took the time off that it would take to make that, it would probably be murderous for the channel, but it's also kind of worth it uh, just to do a video about like all the battles and like the Russian front and the Pacific front and everything else. Like it's, it's really cool um, to me at least. I love stories like this and it's, like World War II especially because like I mentioned, we're kind of in the twilight of the survivors being able, I'd say in another 10 years, there won't be anyone alive who was a part of that war, uh, which is why I feel it's more important now than ever to tell it. Um, but yeah, this, these are just side thoughts in my head. I like short one-off videos like this. I hope to do more in the future. There will be more like horror stuff soon. Um, there's some ARGs I got to cover. There is some ARG updates I got to cover from the looks of it. Um, like Monument Mythos season two just ended, so I kind of want to do something with that before season three starts. Um, but yeah, like some short one-off stuffs like this and then horror going well. Also check out the second channel link in the description below. I will be doing stuff on there soon as soon as I get done with the doing stuff on here very quickly and all at once all the time. Uh, so hopefully you enjoy that. But I believe that should do it for now at least. So as always, Thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.